Well, you know, certain people may choose a wardrobe, an outfit, to convey a message. You may have recalled uh, Michelle Obama and even our First Lady, our current First Lady, Millennium, choosing outfits as they go to foreign countries, they go to different places that send a different message. Maybe they want to identify with a culture, with a community, with a certain... Um, activity that's going on, dressing for India, as Trump's wife did so much uh, this past week, and maybe you found other occasions where she's dressed for an occasion. Today, I'm like them. I've chosen to dress for the occasion. Polka dots. That's right, because the pastor's calling is always that of trying to connect those dots. The tie is an ongoing reminder for me that that's part of my work, helping you to connect the dots to make sure that it makes sense in life, that somehow your spiritual, spiritual life comes together with a comprehension, with an awareness, with an understanding, an enlightenment. So today's journey is all about connecting the dots. That's why we're celebrating a wonderful occasion. It's New Thought Sunday. Since 1915, the world has been celebrating New Thought Consciousness an awareness of the new thought journey within our hearts and our lives. Churches all around the United States and around the world today are honoring New Thought Sunday by taking a moment to reflect on what is new thought, what does it mean for us, and what is the unfolding. But let me tell you, there was a radical teaching that was going out around the world. It started in a small community. It started with one teacher that began to just teach in a way that just seemed so different and so radical. Many people wanted to go out to squelch this teaching and saying, you know, it's so different. It's so unusual because it's all about self-empowerment and accepting responsibility. It's all about helping people to live by the example. It's all about this wonderful journey of a positive, practical way. And who was this teacher that they wanted to squelch and get rid of? Jesus. Jesus was one of the many who expounded a new thought journey for our hearts and our lives. You may say, what's the theme of Jesus' message while he was here on earth? And there are many people who choose different themes. But one that highlights and sticks out for us is you must be born again. Being born again is that renewal experience, that experience that we go through in our life where we make a change, where we've chosen to do something different, repentance within our heart and our life. Repentance is not just crying and saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is so much more than that. It's a change within our thinking. We may have been headed this way, but now we change. And repentance is that 180 degree change. And what do we change? We change our heart, our consciousness, our thinking, our thoughts. And we welcome a new thought. Now, there's nothing new about the new thought journey. It's just maybe a catchphrase that helps to describe in easier detail what we're talking about. It's not about a new trend. It's not about new age. It has nothing to do with all the newness in our world. It has everything to do with the ancient truth that has been expounded for thousands of years. Truth that over time has tried to be suppressed. You know, it's kind of like truth is one of those things like a big beach ball. You know how you try to push it underwater, suppress it down, shove it down, but somehow it keeps popping up all of a sudden when you let it go? So it is where truth, down through the years, people have tried to suppress truth, try to set aside truth, try to uh, cover up truth, trying to say it's not available and hushed, be quiet, let's not talk truth. We found it through the years of the unfolding in the Christian journey. The Council of Nicaea gathered together in 325, 325 years after Jesus' ministry. They're gathering together to say, we need to find who Jesus is. We need to decide so that there might be a sense of unity of people coming together. And we want to make sure that everybody's in agreement so that we can tell people how to live their lives and so that we can be in the authority. And, you know, there's some things out there that have been floating around in teaching that, well, they're kind of radical. They're out there. That kind of things like, you know, maybe that you have personal responsibility for your life. Mm, We don't like that one because the church needs to be the ultimate responsibility for your life and the one who tells you everything and shares, tells you where to go, what to do, how to think. So what happened in the Council of Nicaea is that they began to create a creed, a dogma, rituals, and they began to pull together through this whole uh, gathering of compromising bishops who began to say, well, I believe this, well, how about we let go a little bit of that? 
we take a little bit of this, and we take a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and we, well, you know what happens when you compromise. Ever get too many cooks in the kitchen? What do we say? Too many cooks spoil the soup? You get too many people coming together, and they say, well, you know, not too much salt. Oh, not no seasonings, no flavorings. Let's not go here with that. Let's not go crazy with uh, making it too uh, vibrant in flavor and taste. You know, and before you know what you got is bland soup and boiling water. That's about it. Uh, because too many cooks spoil the soup. And so what happened is all the bishops coming together with all their different ideas and trends and ways. And what happened is, wow, they kind of came up with a compromising idea of what our spirituality is meant to be. Now, it's interesting that Jesus came as a radical messenger of something called the way. That's right, the way, a teaching. Jesus didn't come to start a new church. Jesus didn't come to establish a new religion. He just came to offer a way, a teaching, a teaching that would help us to know how to live our life, that you could embrace if you were Jewish, if you were a Gentile, if you were a Greek, if you were uh, a person of a different faith tradition. It didn't matter who you were. This teaching would be applicable within your life because it was a way of truth. Truth, how powerful it is, because truth is what sets us free. Truth is what liberates us. Truth is the journey of our salvation, and Jesus began to impart, impart truth. And so it was that he began to say, I am the way that's offering this truth. That that which I'm living out as an example for your life is the way. And how beautiful is it began to exemplify for us what it meant to live out truth in our day-to-day -day journey. Sadly, this Council of Nicaea decided to make a change and say, you know what, Jesus isn't going to be the example. He's going to be the great exception. Consequently, since he's the great exception, don't bother. Just worship him. Following him now becomes minimal because you can't do this at home. You can't do whatever he taught you to do. It, that, that's silliness. Why are we thinking that somehow we could do the miraculous and perform that or to be as God or to unfold the goodness that Jesus did? He's the great exception. Let's uplift him. Sidebar note, you know that Jesus never asked to be worshipped? He traveled this journey on this earth and didn't say, please, by the way, worship me. Thank you very much. I'm here so that you might bow down and worship me, celebrate me, because I am the one to be called worshiped. You know, come and gather, and all everyone who gathers, come and worship me. That's not at all. Jesus just simply said, I'm the great example for you. Let me reveal to you how you live out truth, for I am a way for you. I am showing you the way. I'm revealing the way. What happens is down through the ages, then this powerful truth began popping up as people began to suppress it. People said, I don't like that idea of you teaching something about personal responsibility, that you have the power of choice within your life to choose the direction of your life and to choose how you want to live your life and to choose your spirituality and to choose all these things. How about we suppress that one down and push that beach ball down again under the water? But it pops up again. And before you know it, different teachers and different people began to awaken to this inspiration over and over again. Said, this is a truth that we know is ageless and timeless. Now, there was the Gospel of Thomas. People thought it best, oh, it's a little bit too radical. It's a little bit too out there. It's a little bit too much that simply emphasizing these kind of teachers that we like to suppress. Let's get this truth and let's push this one down. And so we're not going to include it in the Bible. We're going to set it aside. We're hopefully, maybe we can even bury it and hide it. Oh, behold, we found it. It pops up again. Truth appears. There are those who in spiritual searching and in spiritual revelation find truth appears. It pops up over and over again. It keeps reappearing within our hearts and our lives. As a pastor, I'm here to help you pop up truth and allow it to flow within our hearts and our lives because this is the liberation power. Truth sets us free. Now, we know that Jesus was referred to as a teacher of the way. And if you look through the Gospels and particularly the book of Acts, you find these continual references to the people of the way. They weren't called Christians. That term came years later. They were called people of the way. Are you the way? Are you the way? And, you know, Saul of Tarsus, he was a Jew who was a biblical literalist, you might say, an advocate of 
fundamentalism of Judaism and said, this teaching of the way needs to be suppressed. So he would go around and gather and try to persecute all those who were people of the way. Read it in the book of Acts. You'll find references to people of the way. Saul has this powerful experience on the road to Damascus. He has this moment where he becomes enlightened by this divine presence. And he is transformed and now in character, as well as in name, he's a new person. Saul becomes Paul, the Apostle Paul. And now he goes about reinforcing this wonderful truth, having had this change of heart and mind. And he becomes a person of the way. In fact, uh, we find that uh, in Acts 19.9, there Paul met in the synagogue with those who became obstinate, and they refused to believe, and they publicly tried to malign the teaching the way. Paul left the synagogue and continued to preach the gospel where it would be heard rather than stay with those who kept, uh, kept trying to denigrate the teaching of the way, of this truth within our hearts and our lives. And even, uh, he says, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a Jew, but I do so as a follower of the way, which they may call a sect. Now that's found in Acts chapter 24, 14. This is our Bible telling us all about the way. What is this way? What is this way? This way is this wonderful revelation of a teaching that says within our hearts and lives that as we embrace our freedom of choice, we have the practical positive spirituality that says, you can choose to believe, to have faith that all things are possible. And you are not limited by the physical world around us. We are called to live in a metaphysical way, meaning uh, beyond the physical. We're spiritual people, aren't we? And what are spiritual people? They're living from an outlook and a, a context of thinking that is beyond the physical removing all sense of limitation within our hearts and our lives. So Jesus began to unfold and to teach. One of the many great teachers of new thought truth, it's not limited to Jesus alone, but here in our Christian Judeo context, we often refer to Jesus as the foundation of so much of our teaching. But he was one of many who began to expound this powerful truth. One of the things he often said is, take my yoke upon you because my burden is light. It's not restrictive. It's not oppressive. It's light. Again, that beach ball of truth popping up. It's that wonderful light. It's easy because truth rises within our hearts and our lives. Yet we find in our world today that uh, religion has tried to create almost oppressive, restrictive rules, dogmas, things that say you're in, but you're out. You're loved, but you're not. You're welcome, but not you. And so it is, we find this kind of restrictive kind of thinking that comes through in our biblical literalisms that began to create a burden that was not light. Suddenly, the world began to say, women are not allowed to preach. Wait a minute. Jesus invoked many great preachers in front of the Gospels are filled with women who spoke out the great message of Mary on Easter Sunday morning, the great message of others who preached and spoke. Yet we find today's world being oppressive, restrictive. But Jesus said, my teaching, the way, take this yoke upon you. Take this way because you're going to find it's light. Not light in the fact that it's just simple or light in the fact that, oh, it's just surface level, but deep in truth, but light in burden. In other words, it's not restrictive because the Jewish people of that day and age were following all these laws. Rules, rules, rules. You don't do this. You don't do that. It was like I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and my Pentecostal background was, you know, you don't dance, you don't chew, you don't go with girls who do. I hold to that today. But, uh, you know, it's still this kind of uh, belief system in our world that, you know, it was so many rules, so many restrictions, so many guidelines, and yet Jesus began to say, here's the positive, practical approach for your spiritual life. As you do so, you find that you find that this is the freedom that is given to us in truth. So what we find here is that as we embrace this new thought, what we're doing is changing a direction. We may have thought lack. We may have thought failure. 
We may have thoughts of mind of sickness. We may have thoughts of, uh, that say, I'm, I'm impoverished. We may have thoughts of victimhood. And what we find is we welcome a new thought. We change the direction completely as we embrace in our spiritual life the welcome thoughts of, I am well. I am healed, I am prosperous, I am successful. And so it is that we embrace a new thought, a new consciousness. It's a change in direction that makes all the world of difference as we welcome a new thought experience. Years ago, the Chicago River would run into Lake Michigan. Did you know that? In the 1800s, the Chicago River was one of the uh, flooding sources that fed into the Lake Michigan and people who began to live along the shoreline of Chicago's Lake Michigan shores began to dump all of their waste and garbage and trash into the Chicago River. Where did it end up? Lake Michigan. Where was their water source? Lake Michigan. Suddenly typhoid, all kinds of health problems began to rise up because the water was rushing in this direction in towards Lake Michigan. And you know what they did in the 1800s? They changed the direction of the river. That's right. They made the river run in an opposite direction. So the flow of everything began to go in a new way, thus providing a cleansing, a healing for the waters of Lake Michigan and the water supply for the city of Chicago. To this day, the waters have been changed in direction and they flow away from Lake Michigan. So it is in the simplicity of our life. We may be bombarded by the waters of thought that want to come to us constantly. And they're coming with all of its trash, all of its garbage. And suddenly we're finding there is a consuming of all kinds of sickness that's coming to our lives. Negativity, doubt, fear, limitation separation and we're wondering about how do we connect with God at all we're wondering where do we fit and we're just constantly bombarded and fed with this and we change direction we let the flow go the other way releasing everything out and allowing there to be a healthy wholeness a cleansing within our hearts and our lives that makes a big change new thought is all about changing direction i am thinking in a new way it's ancient truth that says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's an ancient truth, one that's been echoed down through great sages in different shapes and forms. It's echoed within our, our own scriptures of the Bible. Be ye transformed by the renewing of, this, of your mind. Let it be that you've changed directions in your thought, but you now welcome this wonderful experience. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that we just need to stick our heads in the sand and just think everything is sunlight and roses and everything is just perfect and wonderful, even though we think all around us it's not? You see, here's what happens. As we change our thinking, we change our reality because everything happens from within out. And if we're believing from within, the source within, that the world is falling apart, and we believe that our life is miserable. And we believe that we're called to live in victimhood and suffer. And we believe that we're outcasts. And we begin to believe these kind of things that we're living in a world of lack and that there's not enough. And God doesn't is withholding all the goodness from us. We, well, we've got to release, change the direction, welcome new thinking. It's not sticking our head in the sand. It's rising above the sand. It's actually pulling your head out of the sand because now you're rising to a higher consciousness. You're rising to a new awakening. I pull my head out of the sand, out of the muck and the mire and all the negative thinking of this world. And I rise up to the understanding that in God, all things work together for good. I rise up to this thinking that says, no matter what's going on in my world, I understand that God knows the desires of my heart before I even ask. And that the desire is already unfolding for me even before I begin to even think about it. It's already there. You see, that generates a newfound faith within our hearts and our lives that is all about taking on a new course. Now, there's two interesting things about this new thought journey that are so substantial that we must grasp as we understand thinking in a new way. One is that in our new thought understanding, and the interpretation of the ancient texts and the teaching of Jesus and the example of his life, 
we understand that the divine is in all things. God is in all things. Now, I grew up as a Pentecostal preacher's kid. I went to church every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, and in revivals every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for weeks. I went to church. I grew up in church. I was raised on church. I sat in a pew probably more than I sat in any other context or chair or whatever it may be because I grew up in that environment. Later on, I went to seminary and I became ordained in the traditional, more fundamentalist, literalist context of Christianity. And there we were taught, we believed, we lived a life that God is not in all things. God is not in you. God is separate from you. God is living and dwelling in the heavens up above. God is this wonderful white man who sits on a throne, looks down with long golden or uh, gray hair, I love it. Uh, gray hair and uh, expounds all kinds of judgments, making, declaring for you, you will suffer, you will be punished, I'll withhold from you, you are okay, I'll maybe bless you a little bit. And so there became this kind of concept of the God that we lived in, that God is, an, is not in all things, but God is outside and we're constantly reaching, grasping, trying to find where is this God outside and how do I get this God inside me? So I keep asking, God, come in. God, come in. God, come in. Only to realize I needed to let God out. Let God out. Let God out because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is here and now. God is in you and you and you. God is in all things. Everything is right here now. You've been created in this divine essence and presence of God. And so we must connect the polka dots, that we must pull them all together in some way or form because we realize that if we're created in this image and this likeness of God, God must be in us and in each and every one of us. No matter who they are, whether you have deemed them or judged them good or evil, God is in them. And our calling is to recognize the God in you as we see the God in ourselves. We've asked to first begin to acknowledge, wait a minute, do I see the God in me? Do I understand God is in me? Do I understand the presence of God is right here in me? And when I begin from there, I understand this all that is God is this wonderful love. Well, I can love you because I first see love in me that I can easily see love in you. And that becomes a transformational experience. How silly it is to think that God created all things and from God's own power and presence and intellect and design, all things are created. And then to say, well, but God's not in you. Yet that's sometimes what we're taught. And we believe in this somehow separation, this big gap, this somehow division that God is so removed and far that we're constantly beating our chest, supplicating, begging, pleading, bargaining with God. Offering our firstborn son, offering up a virgin, whatever it may be we can find to try to get God's attention because of this separation consciousness. And we find that all of the teaching of the way, of the truth, of the life is found that the divine is within us. And the second thing that we must call to our attention is that the mind is much more real and powerful than matter. That's a very spiritual teaching that Jesus was trying to get across. We live in this physical world of matter, and we give so much power to it, and we call ourselves spiritual. But we're saying, oh, I'm not really going to go to the spiritual realm because I'm just dwelling in the realm of the physical and the matter. Do you not see all the struggles, all the challenges we live in this physical world where Jesus said, Greater things than this shall you do. You'll do them through the spiritual faith work that you do and you live out. You'll do them above and beyond the realm of the physical. You'll move out into the spiritual. And how silly for us to think otherwise and to think that the, spirit, the physical world has more power over us than the spiritual world. So we think, oh, I've got this bill. I've got financial problems. I've got struggles. There's just not enough money to go around. And I'm struggling in lack. And all I can think is lack, lack, lack. 
and I can't give, I can't share, I can't be generous. There's just not enough to go around. I need to hoard all I can because that's all I live in is the realm of the physical. And then we think, wait a minute. I live in the realm of the spiritual where all things are unfolding for me for my highest and best. And in the spiritual realm, there is greater power than in the physical realm because all things are possible in God, but not all things are possible in the physical realm, right? But God works the miraculous, and that's the example of Jesus. Feeding the 5,000 from loaves and fishes. How many of us would say, hey, here you go. Here's two loaves and here's some fishes. Go ahead and feed 5,000. You'd be going, whoa, in the physical world, that ain't possible. Master, you're crazy. There's no way we're going to feed 5,000. But in this spiritual dynamic, it illustrates for us in the power and presence of God that the spiritual is more power than the physical. The spiritual world opens up the dynamic realm of that which is truly possible, which we think is impossible, but it's truly possible in the realm of the divine. You see that there is one power, and that power is omnipotent. Powerful, and it is greater than any other power within this world. Because evil, does it have power? It only has power if you give it power. Gossip, does it have power? It only has power if you give it power, right? If Holly starts gossiping about Frank and and uh, selling us all this kind of stuff, but nobody else picks up on it, nobody else carries it, nobody else passes it on, nobody else shares it, where does it go? It falls down. It's dead. It's gone. You see, evil in this world is example is ex exemplified by that, in that it only exists as we give power to it. Fear, we give power to it. Worry, stress, we give power to it. Anxiety, we give power to it. We rise up all these things and we simply give power to it constantly in our thoughts. But when we have a new thought, that's with God. All things are possible. Fear, anxiety stress, worry, begin to diminish. They're powerless. They have no power of their own. It's only the power we give it. You see, that's when we understand that in the power of the mind, the consciousness, uh, that our thought is much more real and much more powerful than that of matter or the physical world around us. So we find this exemplified beautifully for us in today's text you so gloriously read together as uh, you were led and we announced, pronounced Proverbs 12, 28. Righteousness. What's righteousness? Right thinking. That's what it is. Correct. Right thinking. Enlightened thinking. Thinking that is coming from a perspective of great understanding, wisdom. Righteousness is the way. What's the way? Righteous. Right thinking. Thinking in the right way. Having that new thought is the way that leads to life and away from death. Now, death meaning, symbolizing this feelings of separation. This feeling that we're removed, that we're not connected. That we're so far removed from anything of the divine presence within our lives. Right thinking is the way that connects us to this wonderful understanding that there is no separation, but that the God of all infinite wisdom and power and presence is at work within us, flowing in us, through us, around us, and always for us. When we understand that's truly the embracing truth of this ancient text of Proverbs, and we break it down, we understand that this right Thinking then will be transformation for us. Right thinking is the way, and the way is to think I am. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the bread. I am the truth. I am the light. I am the life. The I am is the God within us, the presence within us. And whenever we say I am, we're evoking exactly how we see and feel and experience, desire to experience God. I am strong. I am well. I am at peace. I am in perfection. I am successful. I love that passage from scripture that says, and now let the weak say I am strong and let the poor say I'm rich because what of what God has done in us, through us, around us, and forth. This is the way. Right thinking 
is constantly acknowledging the I am, God within us. I am. Now, be careful what you attach with I am. Because we look at the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. And we think, oh, did you say, oh, God, dear Jesus? Or did you express this, the name? First of all, God is not God's name. God is what God does or is, right? And so when we understand that, we understand what is the name of God. And the greatest description is the I am that I am. So if I am is God within us, and what we attach to it is that God within us being expressed, you would use the name of the Lord vain in vain when you say, I am stupid. That would be saying, God within me is stupid. To say, I am just poor. This is to say, the God of abundance that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, for you, that God is poor. For you to say, I am, in any kind of context other than your highest and best in the expression is truly using the Lord's name in vain, using God's name in some sort of way that is in vanity and in useful uselessness and foolishness, because none of that is what God is. Scripture is telling us over and over again, God is love, God is grace, God is might, God is power, God is all things, God is infinite wisdom. So how then can we say that God is anything other than that and still honor God? So it is that we understand I am is the awareness. It's the way of our living. And it leads us from death. And here in this passage, what it's describing for us, the belief that God is absent from us in some way whatsoever. Whenever we then believe I am at work within us, when whenever we embrace that to the fullest, we're acknowledging that God is here within us, not absent. God is right here present, right in this moment. And in this, we understand that there is no condemnation. There's no separation. This consciousness, this awareness of God within us is then so transformational for our lives. Let me tell you this. I love today. I love the New Thought Journey. It transformed my life. Because I'm going to tell you, I've been a pastor for 42 years. There was a time when I just thought, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I had so many dots that weren't connected. I was polka dot. Uh huh. They were all these things that just didn't seem to connect. And I had to sit down and say, Where are you going, Paul? Where are you doing? Because it just, the joy of the Lord is absent from you because this doesn't match with that and this doesn't go here. And all these teachings and everything that the church is saying don't match up at all. And I want to pull it all together. And I had to sit down and say, Holy Spirit, just begin to teach, speak. And teachers were drawn to me. People began to open the doors for pathways of understanding. And it came to me as I began to embrace a new thought, a new thought, a new understanding. And for the first time in my life, the dots started coming together and spiritual truth became to fit together as if puzzles of a piece, pieces of a puzzle were laying one after another in together and unfolding a great picture of life for me. A wonderful experience I want to share with you. That's why as a pastor, I'm passionate about us understanding exactly what Jesus wanted us to know, what he came to teach what he wanted us to live and how to live it out, that it's so positive and it's so practical and it's so powerful, it's life transformational. That's why we celebrate a new thought journey, a change of consciousness, a change of thinking. We have moved the waters of our life from pollution to now restoration. We've changed our thinking and changed our direction. We welcome a new thought. Amen.